You know, I remember as a little child, my earliest memories were that Jesus was going to come again soon. As far as back as I have conscious memory, I remember my grandparents talking about the second coming of Christ. They used to tell us about the stories during World War II. And when they saw all the ravages that were taking place around them, they anticipated that this was the end. I remember my father speaking one time. He had uh, prepared for the crisis. He had built himself a bunker in case bombs start coming. And he uh, filled it all up with food. <clears throat> One of his neighbors saw him and told him, you're a foolish man. There's no bombs coming. One day the bombs came. My dad ran to his bunker, but he could not get in. It was full of people. And they said, if you come in here, we will kill you. He ran away in the open. The German army was coming. He didn't know where to flee. And one day, as the, the, sol that day, as the soldier was coming, they saw him and he came with a, a, a machine gun. And my dad froze. And he told me it was a thin tree like this. And he froze behind that thin tree, didn't know what to do. And the soldier came and looked right at him, but he couldn't see him. And he went in search. My mother was 12 years old in 1948 when her and her mother accepted the message of Reformation. And you know, when you read this song that we just sang, O oh jo joy, O oh delight, should we go without dying? We buried my grandparents. We buried my dad and last year, we buried my mother. This year we buried some of my friends that are about my own age. And we're still waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Question is why? Why are we still waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ? You know, I have a question here. You know, when we look at the second coming of Christ, we look at the prophecies in the Bible about the second coming of Jesus. And look at the people of God, and we have different dates of when they expected Christ to come. Of course, my grandparents, they were sure it's going to come during the Second World War. In Adventism, we have the dates of soon after 1888 and soon after 1844. But when was the first date set for the second coming of Christ? Do you remember? When was the date first set that Jesus is going to come again the second time? I want you to take you back for a moment. Way back to the time of Abraham for a moment. Just we'll start to say a little bit about Abraham and then we'll answer the question of when was the first date that was set for the second coming of Christ? You remember in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, that the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So God says to Abraham, All right, I want you to leave. This is a, you're nice and comfortable. You're, you're very comfortable here. You're, you're in a comfortable situation. You have a nice house. You have a nice land, everything. Ur of Chaldees, from the best we can gather, was a very luscious place. Very pl a place where you can gather wealth very easily. 
And God says, leave. That's what God says. Why? Why does God tell Abraham to leave? Because it says here, there's a principle in Christianity that says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This principle of separation. Why? Because in order that God might qualify him, for the great work as the keeper of the sacred oracles, Abraham must be separated from the associations of his early life. The influence of kindred and friends would interfere with the training which the Lord purposed to give his servant. One of the best things that happened to me in my life is that I left the place where I grew up. Sacramento, California. It was a nice place. <laughs> nice large church. At the time I was there, we had about 78 members. We had a nice orchestra. We had a choir. We had a male chorus. I mean, we had activities. And the Lord told me, it's time to go. I moved to Maryland and... Um, hmm. There were three of us. <laughs> the entire church, three people, that's it. It was the best experience I ever had in my life. Because suddenly you have to become, who, who are you? And maybe to many of us, as we look at Canada and look at different places, especially some of the large cities that need to be reached, how important it would be for some of us to take heed to the message, to get away from, from what? What do you tell Abraham? Get away from your country, from your kindred, all family relations and relatives and your father's house and to go to a new place. But anyway, that's not what we're talking about here. That's another subject. And in order to prepare some of you who, uh, uh, I mean, we need to be prepared to do something like that. And this is why it's very important for each of you, especially you as young people, to consider very carefully uh, January next year. Because that's the next program of Plymouth Leadership College. And you need to make sure that several of you make plans to go there so you can have training to do this work. But let's go back to this about Abraham. So God tells him to leave. And then God makes a promise to him. And he says, I'm going to make you a great nation. And in verse 3, it says there, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And notice this part, In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I want you to pay attention to this sentence here. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. What is that talking about? What is this message? In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. If we look at the New Testament in Galatians chapter 3, it says the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham. What did he preach? What did God preach? The gospel. And what words did God use? In thee shall all nations be blessed. So when God said in Genesis chapter 12, In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed, God was preaching the gospel to Abraham. <coughs> because it was through him that the Messiah was going to come. And when we say the gospel, what is the gospel? In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it tells us that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. When we understand the gospel, we receive the power of God, not just to give us forgiveness, but actually to save us, to change us, to make us different people. And again, that's not our topic. But I want to look at this. 
There is something that was always associated with the gospel. And sometimes we forget this. Sometimes we think about the gospel, we think of spiritual power, we think of spiritual things, and yet when we go to Genesis chapter 12, God first preaches the gospel to Abraham, and then God says in verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. Part of the gospel is the inheritance of land. Did you know that? Did you know that God does not speak only of spiritual things? He speaks also of land and of a land inheritance. And he says to Abraham, unto who? Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there's always a correlationship between the promises of the gospel and the inheritance of land in the Bible. Those two always go hand in hand. So to whom was that land promised? To whom? To the seed of Abraham. And God not only promised this, God entered into a covenant relationship with Abraham. It says, I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations. For what? For an everlasting covenant. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So here is the Abrahamic covenant. It is the everlasting covenant. And part of that covenant, notice this is verse 7. A covenant is a contract. Covenant is an agreement that you make. It is a signed contract. And God says, here is the contract that I make with thee. And verse 8. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee. What? The land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. So God's saying here to Abraham, I am going to give you the spiritual blessing. And together with the spiritual blessing, I am going to give you this land. And to whom does he give the land here in this verse? To who? Only the seed? No, 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 it's here. I will give what? I'm going to give you, Abraham, this land. It's not just the seed. So if God promises, Abraham, I'm going to give you the land, and to who else? And to your seed after thee. I'm going to give them the land. So I have a question for you. If the seed of Abraham inherits the land, but Abraham does not, is that a fulfillment of the promise? No. What has to happen in order for this promise to be fulfilled? Both Abraham and the seed have to inherit the land. This is not a situation of or, one or the other. It includes both of them. Both of them must inherit the land. And only when Abraham inherits the land and the seed inherits the land is the promise actually fulfilled. But you see, at the same time that God says to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. God says something else to Abraham. Same time, he's making that covenant, by the way. We're back in Genesis 15. It says here, I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur of Chaldees to give you the land, to give the land for you to inherit it. And then right after that, you read chapter 15, God says, Abraham, you're going to die. Yeah. Abraham, you are going to die. 
Matter of fact, God tells him in Genesis 15, I'm not going to fulfill this promise yet. And so going down further, chapter 15, he not only says, let's enter into a covenant, he actually goes into the covenant. They do a special ceremony, signing ceremony. Today it's a signing ceremony. Back then, he, he made an altar, he did all these different things. And then he entered into what we call the Abrahamic covenant. An official contract that he makes together with his people. And then in chapter 15, God says, I'm going to fulfill that when? In 400 years. What was the promise? What's the promise? Abraham is going to inherit it. And who else? When? In 400 years. In 400 years, this is what's going to happen. Why 400 years? <coughs> Why do they have to wait 400 years? Huh? Notice here in, in verse 16. <coughs> but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. Why? Because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Abraham, you can't have this land right now. Why? Because these people are still here. And, and, and why are these people here still here? Because the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. But is long suffering for us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, what? God loved the Amorites. Did you know that? Did you know God loved the Amorites? God, had, God wanted to give the Amorites an opportunity for salvation. And so he gives them how long? 400 years. We'll give him another 400 years. So Abraham, this is your promise, but I can't give you this promise because I'm still trying to save the Amorites. So let me tell you something, Abraham. Let me tell you something about this contract that we have right now. In verse 15, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried in a good old age. Of these 400 years, you're going to live a good length of time still, Abraham. But ultimately, you're going to die. What a promise like that. I'm going to give you an inheritance, but you got, you're going to die first. <laughs> you can't use your inheritance yet. I know you like to get it, but you got to wait. You got to die first. Wow. That, that, that's a long time to wait. Before we go back to Abraham, okay, we're going to come back to Abraham in a moment. Let's talk about the seed of Abraham, you know, because, you know, we got a big war going over there in the Middle East. They've been fighting ever since over whose land that is. Everyone claiming to be the seed of Abraham. You know, and obviously the first child of Abraham was Ishmael. So the Arabs say, well, that's our land because Ishmael, he's, he's the one. And then you have the descendants of Isaac. Problem is, the firstborn was Esau. And he's totally not even in the picture. And Jacob or Israel, they claim, oh, that's our land. Each one is claiming the land and different countries around the world are taking their sides on which one they support. Which one is the one that actually has the inheritance and their, uh, you know, United States and some of their allies backing Israel and of course Russia backing the other side. You know, so you have all of this stuff going on there. And we're left with a question, who has the right to that land? 
And you know, when I go to Galatians chapter 3, it has a very important principle. It says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, not on the seeds as of many, but as of one, and to die seed, which is Jesus Christ. It doesn't belong to anybody. It does not belong to any one of them. It belongs to Jesus Christ. That is the seed of Abraham. That's the one in which all the families of the earth were to be blessed. It is to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Does it belong to anyone else? Well, let's take a look. Galatians 3, 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You only become an inheritor of that land when you accept the seed of Abraham, which is Jesus Christ. If you don't accept the seed of Abraham, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, then the land doesn't belong to you. It's simple as that. And when we're talking about being Abraham's seed, we're not talking about some secret thing that you say, okay, I believe in Jesus Christ. In Galatians, it's made it very clear. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You have to make that public. You have to make that decision public through the act of baptism that I am accepting Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And of course, you have to be baptized into His body, which is His church. So we find here that it belongs to whom? To those who accept Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And how? Notice again 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And don't make who we are. Jews, Greeks, Gentiles, whoever we are. We're baptized into the body of Jesus Christ. When I am baptized and I truly accept Jesus as my personal Savior, I then become what? An inheritor of the promised promises of that land. And how much land? How much land are we promised? Are we talking about that little stretch of desert over there? In Romans 4, 13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. It's actually the entire world. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the master of the entire world. It belongs to him. And he is the seed of Abraham. So... Let's then, in reality, we're talking here about the inheritance, not just of the land of Canaan. So when you go to Genesis, it's not just the, the promise of land was not just Canaan. It was the inheritance of the entire world. When? When is the promise fulfilled? Who has to be present? Abraham has to be present. And the seed have to be present in order for that to be fulfilled. There is no way of separating those two. And Abraham was told, you will inherit the land, but you have to wait how long? 400 years. This is why Abraham never considered this earth as his home. In Hebrews 11, verse 10, for he looked for what? For a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This earth was not his home. He had another place to go to. Doesn't mean that it's only spiritual because what are we looking for? A new heaven and a new earth. That is what we are looking forward to. And Abraham similarly, was looking for a new heaven and a new earth. And so when Abraham was on this earth, before he died, how much land did he inherit? Not enough to put his foot on, okay? Not even that much. 
He did not even inherit that much land. Okay? He, got, he, bought, he bought the cave of Machpelah. But when you buy something, I don't know how many of you bought a house or bought a condominium or something. When you put your down payment on it and you pay for it and finally you get it paid off, do you say, I inherited this? No, you bought it. Abraham did not inherit the cave of Machpelah. He purchased it. That means that's not the fulfillment of the promise. Not even enough. Not even enough to put his foot on. That's how much he inherited. The heritage that God has promised to his people is not in this world. Abraham had no, no possession in the earth. No, not so much as to set his foot on. He possessed great substance and he used it to the glory of God and the good of his fellow men. But he did not look upon this world as his home. It's not what he was looking at. But the word of God had not failed. Neither did it finish its final accomplishment in the occupation of Canaan by the Jewish people. Why not? Because Abraham himself was to share in the inheritance. And when was he supposed to inherit it? When? In 400 years. I want you to look at Exodus. <coughs> Moses is coming there to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. They knew God as Elohim. They never heard of Yahweh or anything like that before this time. They did not exist before this time. And then what does God tell him? I am now Yahweh. Okay, I want you to understand me by a new name. And then he reminds them, I have also established what? My covenant with them. With who? With who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To do what? To give them the land of Canaan. The land of their pilgrimage wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. What was the covenant? In 400 years, what are you going to do? You're going to have the land. Who's going to have the land? I want you to pay attention to this. Abraham, you're going to have the land in 400 years. So now, that was the promise, that was the covenant that God made with Abraham. And now in verse 8, And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will what? Give it to you for inheritance. I am the Lord. God says, now is the time for the fulfillment of the promise. And so in order to help the children of Israel in Egypt and Egyptian slavery to understand their responsibility in preparing for the land of Canaan, what happened? While Moses was in the wilderness under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote the book of Genesis. Not just to read quietly in the wilderness. He sent it to the people of Israel. And they were supposed to read the book of Genesis in preparation for the inheritance of the promised land. Have you and I been studying the book of Genesis to prepare for the promised land? Well, he gave it to them. We had better start reading and understanding what is actually there in the book of Genesis. That was the only Bible design that God's people were supposed to have, was the book of Genesis. They weren't supposed to have any more. That's all they needed for the plan of salvation.
Was it God's plan for Egypt, for the Israelites to leave Egypt and spend 40 years in the wilderness? No. Now, that was not the plan that God had for them. You see, God had something in mind. Because, again, when you look at all these promises, what was the promise to Abraham? To give the land to whom? And who else? And himself. But don't forget Abraham. And the seed. Who is the seed? Wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. How can you fulfill the promise if Abraham is dead? And Isaac is dead. And Jacob is dead. Oh, the resurrection then. Yes. That's right. How can the resurrection take place? I want you to stop and think. How can the resurrection of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob take place? Number one, Jesus has to come into this world. Number two, Jesus has to... What? Jesus has to die. And then what? Oh, when? At the end of the 400 years. We're talking about the second coming of Christ being delayed, brethren. It's not delayed since 1844. It's been delayed since the time, since the Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. That's how long has been the delay. Why? Why has the delay been that long? Why, why didn't Jesus come in the days of, Abra of uh, Moses? I want you to stop and think about this. Why did the Amorites have to be destroyed? Why? Their iniquity was full. Do you think for a moment that a just God is going to remove one pe wicked people from the land and replace them with another wicked people? So when the Amorites were displaced and the Israelites came in, the Israelites were not fit for that land. I want you to look in Isaiah. Isaiah 60 verse 21. Talking about the land, it says here, Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. Who's going to inherit the land? A righteous people. In other words, God's going to repopulate the earth with what? And there has not been a righteous people to be inherit the land. And so what has happened? There has been something called a delay. Right from the time of Moses. You think it's any different today? You think God's going to just wipe a wand, swing a wand somewhere and says, now he's going to come and take us to heaven? And a new earth? Brethren, there has to be a change in us. If we're talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, that means there has to be a preparation. When Jesus comes again the second time, he's not going to find a people that look just like the world. I saw a bumper sticker that says one time, I have, I'm not perfect, I've just been forgiven. Sorry, that doesn't work. Forgiveness is the beginning of it all, but it's not the end. And this is not just individually. Ephesians says that he might present it to himself, what? A glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish.
When the world faced a crisis during these last three years with COVID, Christ should have come. But he couldn't come. Why not? Why not? Do we claim to be that church? We may claim, but obviously it's not. This is why last night we were talking about during COVID and all these restrictions, have we been confessing our sins before God? Or do we spend our time grumbling? Grumbling about restrictions, grumbling about what's going to happen in society, grumbling at each other. You're not doing things the way I want you to do it. Brethren, we have a long way to go. We talk about the second coming of Christ, brethren. We got to change. We have to change. Because that's the church that Christ is waiting for. There is a work of preparation. And now we have a little breather. Yeah, we have a little breather now. We get, we, between pandemics, because there's another one coming, as we mentioned last night. There's a lot more than, than this one in prophecy, okay? And during this time of a breather, are we going to prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ? Are we going to go through another pandemic, another world war? Who knows what we're going to go through? Just wait one after the other and then what? So how do we hasten the coming of Christ? Let's take a look at this just for a few minutes here. In Acts chapter 3, there are some very specific things that need to happen. Number one is what? Repentance. This is not you repenting. It's not them repenting. It's not all those guys repenting. It is what? Me repenting. How's that? Not even us. <laughs> Starts with you and me, brethren. Repentance and conversion. Genuine repentance and conversion. And you can't repent if you still see yourself righteous. If you think you're good enough, then you can't repent. You know, I was talking to someone the other day, and they were talking about how many of our young people are just not making right decisions. Well, they got to hit rock bottom. Why? Because they can't repent when they think they're okay. So what do you got to do? You got to hit some hard times? COVID wasn't hard enough? You want something more? You really want something more? Or is it time to repent right now? Pray to God and earnestly plead with God and say, God, show me who I am. Show me my character. Show me who I really am. Because, you know, I don't know how long we're going to be here. You know, I was there in California and I told a friend of mine, I'll see you next time. He's only like, what, three, four years older than me. Next time was his funeral, okay? We don't have a lot of time. Repent now and be converted now that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And it goes on. And he shall send Jesus Christ. When? When our sins are repented and converted and blotted out. Then Jesus Christ, which was preached before unto you, will be sent. But you see, verse 21 says, Whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. In other words, there's a work of restitution. Jesus is still in heaven because we as a people still need to reform. Yes, reformers need to reform. All of us need to be reformed. It's supposed to be a reform movement, okay? And we have comfortably become a reformed church. We're established. We're done. Movement means continual change. We need a lot more changes. We need to be hungry for evangelism. We need to be hungry and not be satisfied with a nice church here in Etobicoke in Toronto. There should be 10 of these in Toronto. 
Why aren't they? Because we need to repent. We need to be converted. We need to understand what restitution of all things means. In other words, Jesus has to stay in heaven until this happens, until God has a people. And tragically, if we look at history, it's going to be with us or without us. You know, it's going to be either we're going to do it or somebody else will. God's going to give it to another group, another time, another chance maybe. Why? But you know, each time another group has to start all over again, I tell you what, it's a lot harder. You look at history, it's always been harder and harder on the next generation. God is calling for each one of us. First conference like this in, in what, three years? We have a lot of repentance to do for three years. <laughs> a lot of self-evaluation to do. The coming of Christ is not just because there's some clock up there that says, okay, now is the time. It's actually dependent on a people who are preparing for Jesus Christ. The question is for you and me, because we have become very comfortable. <laughs> we are comfortable in our homes, we are comfortable in our environments, and we're comfortable in our religious condition. It's interesting, this statement here, we are getting ready to move. Then let us act if we were there, if we were. Are you seriously preparing to move? You know, when you move from one country to another, I've moved a few times already, okay, from one country to another, not just one state to another. You know, we thought it was hard enough. I remember leaving California for the first time. I don't remember moving from Yugoslavia, okay? I don't remember that. I was only two years old, okay? But I remember moving from California. I had everything in one car. All my belongings there was in one car. We moved. I moved to Maryland. And then in Maryland, I remember moving the first time with uh, my wife, and we had a small little U-Haul. And then, you know, and all of that stuff, okay, then you get a bigger U-Haul and all this stuff, and then you move overseas. It's like, whew, that's a whole different world. Are you getting ready to move to a new world? Are you personally... And myself, are we personally restoring all things that God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began? And we're not talking about just things. We're not just talking about, about uh, restoring uh, certain things. Like, you know, we talk about marriage and Sabbath and all of those things. What about restoring with each other? Yeah, restoring our relationships. You know, COVID has done a nice thing to break away relationships, okay? We don't see each other anymore. We don't do any of that. And half the time, you can't even see each other when you do see each other and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's been a wonderful thing to destroy relationships. Emotionally, you look at some of the statistics, emotional damage that has been done. And how about here in church? Has there been emotional damage done? Not only by COVID, but by everything else? Some of us are already at the foot of the grave. Have we reconciled the things with each other? You know, I was... Um, one of our pastors, was, he had died. And uh, family asked me to do the funeral and... After the service, I looked down and I saw one of the brethren, and they used to, this pastor and this brother, they've had the long rift for many years. The pastor died, and they never reconciled. And I went to the brother who was the last one standing from all the ones that were having a fight with each other. I said, you know, you're the last one. Are you still going to go unreconciled to your grave? Are you still going to go bitter to your grave? His answer was, I'm not bitter. Oh, yeah, wow, okay. <laughs> a 
What about us? Is there somebody you have to reconcile with? You know, when we're talking here about restoration, we're not just talking about, about things in our life. We're talking about with people, within the church, there needs to be restoration. And you know, right now, I want you to think about this verse. Because we're talking about why hasn't Jesus come yet. It says, for he had said, I have heard thee in the time accepted. And of the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, right now, you and I have this opportunity. This is a great opportunity for us to start anew. To decide right now that I'm going to give my heart to Jesus Christ without reservation. That I'm going to surrender myself fully to the Lord. And have a new experience with Jesus Christ. May the Lord help us today, brethren. That right now, as you're sitting there in the pews that every one of us may take this opportunity to examine our hearts and to surrender ourselves fully. Amen.